My name is Hans Tubo. I'm the president of the EDU, and uh, I'm very happy to have the chance to introduce uh, Tran Torswick for his uh, medal lecture. Uh, Tran Torswick will tomorrow receive the Arthur Holmes medal, which is one of the, the union lectures given every year by the EDU. It also will include honorary membership of the EDU. And um, th this is the highest achievement uh, a scientist can receive, or the highest uh, honor that a scientist can receive from the EDU. Uh, I will not take much time on introducing Trond. Those who want to hear more about uh, his achievements, uh, uh, well, the, first of all, we are here to hear about his achievements by, presented by himself, and uh, that should not be done by me. The other thing is that uh, the medal will be awarded tomorrow, and there will be a full citation uh, during that event, the uh, EDU award ceremony to which everyone is invited. There will be a reception afterwards. Uh, so here, I'll just uh, read aloud uh, the short citations uh, for uh, uh, Trans um, achievements. So he's awarded uh, the Arthur Holmes Medal for outstanding contributions in the application of paleomagnetism uh, to plate tectonic reconstructions, and it's found that they have fundamentally changed our view of the solid Earth and in particular by linking uh, deep, Earth's deep interior to the geological record. So this is really a very broad series of achievements. Tron started out in paleomagnetism and has later on developed it into a, a broad holistic view of uh, the Earth and I'm sure we will see some extremely interesting uh, results and points of views. So, Trond, please let us hear about your scientific achievements and uh, I'll congratulate with uh, uh, the Arthur Holmes Medal. Okay, thank you Hans for those nice words. So, um, when I was first told I, I got this prize, I was really wondering what kind of titles. I made it very brief or very broad, it's actually the name of our center of excellence in Oslo. So, so Earth evolution and dynamics is um, very broad. But you have to remember Arthur Holmes' titles, if you look at his career, he wrote a book when he was 22, 23, which was called The Age of the Earth, and other titles was The Origin of the Earth and so forth. So, um, <coughs> so I... Uh, we call it Earth evolution and dynamics, and... But I, uh, it is really about linking surface and deep earth uh, processes which I've been kind of working for about 12 years after a very old man came into my life called Kevin Burke, he's still alive, he's 87. We were supposed to work on something in the South Atlantic doing reconstructions, but after about half a day together we realized we have no, there was no way we could agree on the evolution of the South Atlantic. So, so then we decided to, to do something else, and that's what I'm going to talk about for the next 45 minutes. There's a few key words there. Uh, if you're going to connect something to the deep mantle, you need absolute plate tectonics. And about 12 years ago, we didn't really know how to do it except using hospital reference frame. Um, longitude is, uh, became an obsession with me because everyone who's done a first course in paleomag knows we cannot do longitude, so we had to come up with some dirty trick and see how it works. Uh, true polar wonder is another one. Most people go to sleep when we start talking about the spin axis is changing with respect to the surface and the mantle, but it's very important if you're going to link it to the mantle. Um, talk a little about hotspot. La Dignes province is really what we focus on. Uh, there had been an attempt to you know, look at the distribution of hotspots on the surface and try to uh, relate them to mantle, deep mantle heterogeneities, but some showed some correlation, some don't. The problem with hotspots, these are catalogs, and it can vary between 50 and 80 in these catalogs, but the, many of these are not from, from, the, from the deep mantle. There must be a point. So that's why I went to La Dignes province. That's the really catastrophic melting of the upper mantle. These are the big thing. But then you have to reconstruct them. Hotspots, you don't have to do it. 
talk about a little about Kimbalaya, mantle plumes, and then tomography and deep earth. So that's, um, that's kind of, but before I start, I just want to just want to tell you, I'm from, I'm from Norway, and I started at the University of Bergen. I just want to point out two very key characters in my life. To the left there, you see Rayla Lovely, uh, who unfortunately passed away some years, and he taught me everything about lab work. So I was a real kind of lab rat, measuring everything. This is the first spin and magnetometer I ever used. But when I came, they didn't even have computers, so my task was actually first to get a signal out of it and actually record something. So it was not just collecting. Um, we talk about 79, 1980, computers were not like, like uh, students are used to today with all the software and so forth. But another one, I really came out of mathematics and I got interested in geomagnetism and just the building. This is now where the Bjorkness um, Climate Center in Bergen holds house. But I also got interested in geology and my very great friend who really helped me was Brian Sturt. He also passed away some years ago. And uh, he got me interested and excited about Western Norway. Here's a photo by another long-term friend, Togo Andersen, who's here. We actually went to children's school together. Um, and here you see a picture of one of the Devonian basins and, um, and um, low angle normal faults there. But I also, uh, in the beginning, so I did paleomagnetism, but I really, and I started off with my favorite continent, Baltic, I hear. So I'm from Oslo here. But uh, when I came to Oxford, I met this gentleman here, also unfortunately passed away, Stuart McCarrow, we call him Mac. And he got me really geared up doing global reconstruction. But at that time, when I came to Oxford, for instance, if you look at Palimago, Baltica, actually Baltica was on the equator, and Avalonia, it's actually a map we produced at about 1990 uh, from Palimag, where we had southern England, Avalonia, part of Gondwana, separated by an ocean at the Baltic and then to Laurentia. And because we did no longitude, I can take Baltica and I can move it around here. Um, but we, we then used uh, fauna, so that's why I became a very important part of my life, actually used fauna and also facets to, to, to distinguish. If in this case here where the trilobite found is very different, uh, I'll put them in positions who actually have an oceanic separation. So, so this was some sort of the first kind of semi-quantity way of doing longitude in this reconstruction. But you cannot, cannot really use this for any serious geodynamics and so forth. So, so from this, um, I got preoccupied in longitude. So I'll, I'll talk a little about um, what I call a hybrid mantle reference frame. And it's really to do absolute plate tectonics, because if you look at these, some of these maps, the one I previously showed, it's not really plate tectonics, it's actually continental drift. Uh, we have nothing we t tell you about the oceans. There is just some continental plates moving around. So, um, but you need an absolute uh, reference frame. And um, of course, we can use a moving hotspot or fixed hotspot, which used to be, but that only brings us back to 130 million years. And then we have to go to Paleomag, and then there was some correction, I come back. We can then make a global, a global uh, hybrid reference frame so we can link surface processes with things in the mantle. So that, that's, that's um, what I'm going to talk quite extensively. Just. Uh, one slide, there, is, there are many uh, moving hotspot reference frames. One of my dear colleagues, still colleague, Bernard Steinberger, pioneered this. And uh, it's in 2004, he actually did the first one, which I consider is a serious breakthrough. In, in, but he used four hotspots. This is from one of our postdocs. He was trained by, by um, Bernard. And it's the latest one here. We use five hotspots, Hawaii, New England, Tristan, Louisville, and Reunion. And of course, we have to know the age and ge geometry of the hotspot. We, we have to sort out the relative plate circuits, and that's not necessarily easy when you go from the Pacific to, to the Indo-Atlantic, um, definitely before 83 million years. And um, if you're going to do this moving hotspot, we also have to do some backward advection uh, of present mantle density structures. So this is the kind of model I use. This is from 2012. But of course, if you really want to go back to early his, Earth history, hotspotting, and be aware also, not everyone believes in that. We have, a whole, we have a whole society, you know, mountain plumes don't exist, but if you now bear with me that you accept this, it actually only takes us 3% in, 
into Earth history, backwards. So that's very tiny. So that's um, what a moving hotspot can take of time. So then we need paleomagnetism. Um, but it gives you latitude and orientation, that's a rotation. And of course in paleomagnetism, it's really the inclination, if you have a volcanic eruption on the equator, the field is flat, so let's say in Austria where I come from, if I look at volcanoes which are about 300 million years, they actually have a very flat inclination, so I can say, hey, Austria is today on 60 degrees north, but it must have, this must have erupted about the equator, okay? But the problem with this longitude, let's say now this could be Oslo, it's quite steep pointing down. It doesn't matter in longitude along here. The field we'll be recording in, it would have a dip and it would point roughly north-south, okay? So I have no idea in longitude. So that's our, that's our problem. <coughs> and sometimes I make a joke about longitude because longitude isn't actually quantified on this planet at all. It's just made up, okay? The Brits got it through green, which is zero meridian. You know, the French wanted it, but they got a meter instead of the zero meridian. So it's, it's kind of, it's not something astronomically you can actually say, here's the zero meridian. But it's, we need some uh, relative means. So just very briefly, what we do then, since we don't know this longitude, we, we try to, when we compile all the data from all over the world and we do this, relative plate um, circuits, the idea is to find the continents which has moved the least in longitude. So uh, let's say Africa is sending some here. If, it, if we can find the one which has moved the least in longitude and we relate it all to that, then we minimize all this thing. So you don't want to use South America, which has, which has gone a lot in, in longitude, or North America or India, which has gone. You want to find, and it turned out that Africa is the uh, is the ideal candidate. So that's why we do it, when we do this relative plate circuit, we first rotate everything to Africa. We close all the ocean, pre drift extension and so forth. And, uh, and then we assume, this is the first assumption, that Africa, through its time, hasn't moved very much. So this is a very important, because by making that assumption, we actually uh, made, we, we could see some relations to the deep earth by doing this immediately. If this premise was totally wrong, a lot of what I show you, which I claim to be correlation, wouldn't work. Also at Africa, <coughs> surrounding mostly by, by, by spreading ridges except in the north, so it's kind of it capped in some sort of longitude position. So this is what we do. I'm not going to go through all these things, but we have to compile all the parameters worldwide. We rotate them to South Africa because that we think is the player. Then we make what we call um, parent polar wonder part, but this is a global one, so I call it a gap wap only goes to 250. So you can see now, by, by keeping Africa fixed, you can see how the poles move in relation to it. And then from these plate circuits, we can reconstruct the world back, and we have this, what we can call a global parameter reference frame. So now I have longitudes on here, okay? So now I assumed, I, I'm kind of roughly know the longitude, and I'm assuming Africa is reasonably stable here. Um, but to build this hybrid reference frame is that when you're in a mantle reference frame, and in this case we go back to 120, that's a mantle reference frame, and true polar wander is not detected. You can never detect true polar wander in a mantle reference frame. And of course, parameter data are, are um, because the, the, the whole, the Earth's lithosphere in the mantle is actually an oscillatory pattern with respect to the spin axis, and you have to sort that out if you're going to marry a hotspot reference frame with a paramagnetic reference frame. So what we do then, we, we made that uh, global reference frame, uh, but we assumed we had zero longitude, but of course we know from, uh, from this hotspot frame, Africa has moved a little, so it turned out the cumulative effect is about 10 degrees, is 120, and then we actually shift all the longitudes 10 degrees, and we keep it at the same. Um, and then we have to correct for this true polar wander. And in 2008, actually, we actually had no idea how to correct for this. Again, my colleague Steinberger, Steinberger, who I presented a diagram to him, and I said, "Can you figure out how to get to get to estimate true polar wander?" He said, "This is very difficult." But he came back in three days, and voila! It turned out to be very simple. You, you have a reconstruction here, and um, at 250 and 200, and, and this is where we have true polar wander, and you can see the whole planet is rotating on a point, this white, on a point on the equator. The whole Earth is rotating in a coherent way, and this is a sign of true polar wander. 
The other thing he discovered was that, come back to that, but we have these two um, uh, lower mantle heterogeneities, I call them Jason and Tuso, some call them large low shear velocity promises. Turn out at that point in longitude, it's actually very close to the center of gravity and the lowermost mass of these things. So here you can see the center of gravity in the, in the bottom 300 kilometers of Tucson and Jason there, and it's, the, it's actually the mass of the continents. And by doing this thing through time, uh, here's, a, here's a diagram just showing how much departure do you have from the present day situation through time. And if you go back to 300 million the SI, you can see it's uh, f five, six degrees. And here now you get the faces of true polar wonder, and then it's actually going back the other way. Here actually there are zero true polar wonder and, uh, and so forth. So it turned out to be very easy to do this thing. Um, it's just to look. You, you, of course, you have relative movement and continental drift going, but you have to look for that underlying coherent movement where everything seems to rotate. And by definition, it has to be a point on equator. So, so this one is not playing, it doesn't matter. Um, but then we have a global mantle frame um, through time. So that's, that's what we can use. But at this point now, we can only use this to when Pangea formed. That's the, we, that's the only time we come back where we are reasonably sure we have the relative plate circuit. We also have to do some estimates of um, uh, pre-breakup extension and so forth, but it only works to 320 million years. And as I said, hot spotting is only 3%, but still this is, this is only 7% of Earth history. That's also, if you really want to go back in time, it's not much. So we can combine this thing back to the late Carboniferous, 7% of Earth history. And, and for a while, I thought, is this a dead end? You know, this is it, you know? We can only make these nice movies back to 320 million years. Uh, and of course, there was an assumption here. We are using this that Africa hasn't moved too much in longitude. So this is where the deep mantle comes in. So should we give up, or can the deep mantle help us? So that's kind of more or less the rest of the talk. So, and they're coming into this uh, linking surface and deeper processes. And um, I show many of these maps, but, and also yesterday, uh, people presented uh, many maps of the deep mantle. So this is at uh, 2,800 kilometers. And this, this one you probably haven't seen because it's, it's our new, which we have developed at SEED. We call it S10 mean. But they, they all look very similar. But the main point, beneath Africa, uh, we can see the, the, the lower than average share, uh, maybe about three, three and a half percent low, lower, lower share velocity velocities. And then you have Jason, and these are, these are remarkably antipodal. They're almost 180 degrees. And the, the mass of center, it's slightly offset from the equator, but, but these are very remarkable features. <clears throat> but the question is, so two equatorial antipodal, a um, lot of discussion if to a thermochemical or thermal, I'm more, I'm basically interested, are they, have they been stable? This is something you see today in tomography. Has it been, could, could, this, could the planet also look like this 100 million years ago? Or, two, or roughly, I'm not saying they're fully stable, but the idea now we are, we are pursuing, can these be stable? Because then I can use them for something, for a new way of reconstructing continents before Pangaea. So, and for how long? And... Um, so this is a lot of the work I started with Kevin Burke. When Kevin Burke approached me, he said, because he's very controversial, he said, there will be a lot of rejections. And I never had so many paper rejected. Basically, everything from now on, we, we, it was going through one magazine to the other, and they said we were mad, you know. So, um, and, and typically, if we used a tomography model, they would say, well, you, it fits maybe that tomography, but what about another one, you know? So we had to come up with these endless showing them. And the one we really used a lot is the one from Torsten Becker, which is, which is ASMIN, which is actually an in integration of three shear wave models. So these are the three which went into the ASMIN, which we used a lot. And again, these are now projected uh, on the Pacific. So again, you see Tuso here and Jason. And if you look at all these, they, they are quite similar. Another thing, there's, uh, there's, uh, some of these have quite sharp edges in the lower mantle, and uh, what we did to define where are the margin, what we call the plume generation sound, would actually to calculate the horizontal gradients in these models, and they do differ. Uh, in the ASMIN, 
became the 1% slow, which I kind of compare, we call it the plume generation sound. Uh, in this new one, I showed in the previous, in this S10 mean, it's a 0.9 slow. But you can see they look very similar. Uh, also, we noticed very early that someone now called a perm anomaly. We, we kind of more describe it, maybe it's part of two or some arm. It's also suggesting it might be. Um, so, so there are these plume generation sounds because that becomes important then. <clears throat> when I want to correlate now uh, surf, uh, linking um, surface and deep, um, I'm kind of guiding myself by plotting these lines in various, to try to understand how, for instance, slabs when they're sinking in here, uh, for instance, moving along and how they can actually initiate plumes on the margin of these things. So I'll just show hotspots first because some people try to see how present-day hotspots look with a deep mantle. This is uh, latest cat by French and Romanovich and these are the one they, they, they call it primary or clearly resolved. They also had a third cut of seven somewhat resolved. So I'll put them all on here from their catalog. Without, and then if you then put on a tomography, so again now I use this S10 min, you can see now Tuso, um, and of course if you don't know the name of this, this is of course from Tuso Wilson and the other one is Jason Morgan. So that's where the names come. Um, you can see the low velocity sound here. If you look at the one, from, the one they, they think are deep, which I think they can see in tomography all the way from the bottom to the top are these. And for the African, so Iceland is sitting up here, and you, you, you see them, they're kind of, this almost looks like on the margins of Tuso. In the, in the Pacific, Hawaii is, so here's this line, which we define as the plume generation sound. You can see Hawaii is sitting there, but you, you also see some more, which are actually more in the interior here. But it's clear that, that these are the one which they think they can see all the way from the bottom to the top, uh, show a very clear correlation. And there is just some examples from Hawaii. I was amazed with this model there because um, you know, many tomographers can say, well, I might see this one, this little blurry, I can just see in the bottom, I can just see here, and suddenly this one is kind of, it's, it's kind of saturated in red. There are thick, nasty plumes everywhere. The mantle look very, it's, it, yeah. It's almost like you don't really have mantle circulation at all. It's just some sort of sluggish mantle, the whole thing. So, um, and here's an example from, um, from Iceland where you run a profile roughly through here. So, so these actually two would kind of be a profile strength. So, um, main point here, they're all linked to Jason and Tucson. At least the one they claim, Franz and Romanovich, the one they claim to be seen in tomography, and I'm not a tomographer, um, uh, seems to be linked to these things. <clears throat> so uh, before I go on, just another, another thing with this Tuso and Jason, um, also in modeling, it, it's kind of portrayed very often as just this kind of layer, just a few hundred kilometers, maybe 500 kilometers on the core mantle boundary. But if you look in this tomography, it's clear that this thing is sticking up to about a thousand kilometer. <clears throat> so I just, and, um, and if these are thermochemical pi, for instance, you know, then they are portrayed to be, to be heavier. They're hotter, but heavier. They actually be term, uh, to be, uh, they will actually be neutral buoyant, these things. And the only way to explain the geoid, the high geoid here, is actually that the stuff about them clearly must be hotter than average mantle. And this is, um, this is also the French and Romanovich model, but here I got my dear friend, um, Vince Bachmann to make a movie where I centered it on Tuso and it's rotating around. But it's really to see how the shape of Tuso, so now we are, we are rotating around the center of, of, uh, of Mars in the lower mantle and you can, you can see how this changed through time. I just, um, and for instance, many times when you think about African, we used to see it in a special profile where it has this very inclined feature toward afar, for instance. But that's, that's, that's really how you look. You, it will come up now. You see the line here now, it's rotating. When it's now approaching uh, afar, you will kind of see the more classic way how the profile people like to show. So now you see, you see these very inclined coming up. To, 
But the main point with this is, you know, it's not just the bottom layer, the whole mantle above them, probably 2,000 kilometers. So what I want to address now, because this is a present-day phenomenon, uh, how, test how, lo how long could this have been stable like that? So now I'm going to use my reference frames to reconstruct things back in time. And then we need large igneous provinces. We don't have many of them, we have about 30. Um, so for Siberian traps, Afar, which I, I showed uh, Perenna and Dek, about 135, Karoo, 183. So what we do here now, instead of rotating the polygons with all the, all the volcanic uh, outlines, we just try to, where, to estimate where are the centers of these large igneous provinces today. And that's not always easy. It's much easier in the Precambrian, where you have eroded away all the basalt and you're looking into the plumbing dike system. You can almost step on where this thing came through the lithosphere. But uh, and when you look at them today, they're, they're recent, they're, because plate tectonics have moved in, these around, so you almost have a random distribution of these things. Um, so I'm just going to show you, I reconstruct three of them. So this is, this is one from, we call a Skagrak uh, lip, which actually is, so there is Oslo, it's here. We have the Permatrassic Siberian trap, and here's the camp, for instance. And when we reconstruct these now uh, on the, if we now just project them straight down to the commonal boundary, and of course, we, cannot imp we have no idea about advection or mantle wind, we just had to shoot, it, it wasn't significant, so we just had to drop them. What you can see now then, so here's the plume generation sound. So if we start with the oldest one, Siberian traps used to hang around this anomaly here, which some people call the perm anomaly, or it could be just a prolongation. And if you look at this um, Skagra eclipse, 297 million years, it's on a margin there, and camp is on a margin here. So here you see uh, a clear-cut example of things which seems to be on the margins of these features. So if you do them all from 15 million years to 297 million years, so there's the one I showed you before, Siberian clip, you see now, like some of the hotspots, that these are, this, Siberian traps is a little funny uh, because it's not, part of the core of Tuso, but if you look at the one here now, they almost bang on the margins. They're never in the middle, where, so they come from the margins. Um, when you go to the Pacific, uh, there are also some maybe coming slightly in, but be aware now, when you start reconstructing things into beyond 83, 84 million years, we don't really know very well the plate circuits or the motion of Pacific plate. So this is where we'll have the biggest uncertainty. This is far more certain than actually reconstructing. So, um, so this was something we noticed more than 10 years ago. And originally modelers, we, um, we started getting the paper. When we showed this map and said plumes came from the modern, we were rejected by all modelers because they said, it can't be right because I can't model it. Okay? So that was a very weird kind of rejected paper. If a model I can model it, it must be wrong. So on a mantle conference, I told all the modeler, the one who can model them, I will give a bottle of champagne. And Etan, who's, he was the first one to do it, would go, and suddenly they could do it. So, and of course we hire a lot of modelers, but I've learned that you can model anything you want, if you want, okay? For instance, we do a lot of modeling, you know. Um, so, what, because what I'm saying here, you see this pattern, and there is a big anomaly, Columbia River. This is not perfect. The planet is, Kevin likes everything to be perfect. I would say we have anomalies here. And that would be the next why, uh, um, for instance, Columbia River ball so is the youngest, but it's also tiny, small, okay? Tiny little piece. Although the Americans think it's a big thing. So, um, the main point here, they come from the margin. If you see this system, um, and they go back to 300 million years, that tells you that these structures here, I don't say exactly like that, but something like this, has been stable for 300 million years. Okay? And that also made an out row in modeling. Some said, oh, okay, I accepted a 200 million year, but 300 million year, no way. So we still have these discussions. But from my point of view, you can keep them there forever. If you just make them heavy enough and stiff enough, you will never get rid of them. So again, this is a model exercise. You play with the, the, what they are and you can get rid of them and have them. It's, um, it's, it's just a modeling exercise. 
So, so we did this with, um, with um, La Dignes provinces. And of course, you don't find a new La Dignes province every, every day. So we thought there's something else. You know, we thought about carbonatites, people said it could be. What about kimberlites? They must be deep because uh, they're bringing up diamonds. The diamonds are sitting at maybe 180, 20 kilometers. So you need flow below there. So it's not some sort of, just some sort of tangential cracking or whatever to make this thing. You need something from, from the deep. So um, we went to Kimberlites, and then we were lucky. Um, probably with Kimberlites, they're not very well dated. They are public databases, but in the public databases, maybe only about 300 are dated. But through my cooperation with De Beers, who date every diamond and never publish it, suddenly we had almost 2,000 age data because of our cooperation with De Beers. Very well dated. So, and this just is, you should know, of course, um, Kimberlites were in, in only the old cratons and thick, thick cratons, they are the diamond carriers, and they come up very fast. I was intrigued when I started reading the literature that, um, that you, from 180 kilometer, you can bring this thing up in three hours. You know, it comes up as a splashing water, CO2 nightmare. Luckily, I've never been around when this happened because it leaves a big hole. And, um, but there is not a uniform distribution. Of course, most of them we know are Cretaceous, between 80 and 90. So when you go back in time, there, there isn't terribly many of them. But, um, and we know, we know the distribution, we know the ages of these things. This is just to show you an example. I make a reconstruction, 160 million years, draped on the, on the tomography of the deep mantle. So here's my plume generation sound. And, and now I plot where I have Kimberlites in Australia, South America, Northwest Africa, into North America. And you can see the pattern looks like what we did with large igneous provinces. And here's 130 million years. And we had a perennial and deck at about 135. But we find Kimberlites uh, in, um, in Namibia. And we find it in Northeast Africa and also North America. And, also, and again, you can see this. But I'm saying here, at most, not all, be aware, because it's not as good as Ladinia's provinces. Okay? Maybe 80%, 85. Lips, maybe 95%. Hotspots, maybe 50%. So I'm not saying all of this come. Kevin Burke would say it, it all come from there. So that's why we argue all the time. Um, I think there are anomalies, and they have to be explained in different ways. So this is just to, and now I want to show you more anomalies. So here is 1,395 Kimberlites back to Pangaea, and, and 25 lips. And now you can see the Ladignes provinces, one anomaly, Columbia River basalt. But then you see those white here, for instance. These are striking anomalies. And where do they come from? They come from North America, Canada. So, uh, where, and they are all Lake Cretaceous, early tertiary. They don't fit to this pattern. So you have a lot of igneous province not fitting. You have Kimberlite, and even Hotspot. If you start looking what are being claimed to be Hotspot, none of them actually show a very clear signal of being deep. So there are these anomalies. So that's a target for someone to figure out why. So just some little cartoons. Since I don't really do modeling, I make cartoons. So it's kind of a profile from uh, South America uh, into Indi uh, Madagascar, India. Uh, so this is the time of the Perenna Tandeka. We have some, some idea that, well, slabs restore mass of the lower mantle, and they're possibly triggering mechanism. But of course, my partner don't like that because he work on Mars, and we don't have plate tectonics. So they also have the degree two in their plumes, and then we have to look for something else. So be aware, there's only work on Earth, because Earth is the only terrestrial planet that we know have plate tectonics. So this is not applicable to other terrestrial planets. Um, but this is kind of uh, South America. We had subduction along the margin there. If this was a triggering, where the Perenna Tendeca, nothing actually on, on the other margin here right at that time. So there's two so. But uh, if you go on a little time, if you go to 65 million year, we had a Deccan along that profile on the other side. And of course, um, the, um, the Perenna Tendeca is related to what we now think to the Tristan. So we have the Tristan hotspot uh, being fed there. And then if you go to, to today, of course, the Deccan and India has moved away, and that's presently where we have the reunion. And I think also, if you have this kind of mechanism where it's, it's actually a triggering threat from, from subduction, the, the margin of South America is now so far away that this mechanism is beginning less and less effective. And if you look at a hotspot track for Tristan for the last 30 million years, it's very diffuse, uh, little bubbles here and there, and you, you wouldn't know it was a hospital track for the last 30 million years. 
<clears throat> so this might be one way of explaining. I'm not really, I'm not a petrologist uh, or a mineral physicist, of course there's a lot of discussion, what are these things? Uh, we can see them today, I've shown you they've probably been stable at least for 300 million years, I'll show you later, probably more, they're antipodal, and it's not only this basal layer there, it's, this, this might be the kind of thermochemical and more heavy component. What above it we, he we heard yesterday was speculation is, is it just warmer and buoyant or could it actually be basalt there? Because all the theory is what it is, the materials, basaltic or iron rich peridotite. But there are people arguing, and I'm, I'm not in that business. Or maybe it's both, that's what we heard about yesterday. So maybe some, some of it's primordial, at least, I think, but you also have recycled. Uh, oceanic composition. So, um, the last, uh, some slides, that was only back to Pangaea, 320 million years ago, and of course, and we see this pattern, can we use it for something? So now you're coming to the core of what I want to say. Because we have this, since Pangaea, we see that plumes, that source lips, not all of them, but basically all of them, uh, maybe 80 percent of kimberlites are derived from the edges of Tuso and Jason. So here is, here I call it large low shear velocity problem. So this is Tuso or or Jason. So we have the plume generation sound, lips and kimberlites. <clears throat> so we can take this phrase from the bears. They have a diamond is forever. So I would say a, a LLSVP is forever, or Tucson or Jason is forever. Question mark. So. Um, so motivation now is if we can maintain this, can we now use this to make a new way of reconstructing continents? Because we have we are kind of exhausted our limit here now. So so that's the purpose. And this turned out to be very simple. I'm actually not showing it before Pangaea, but I'll show you the example how we do this. This is actually in the late Permian. We have Pangaea, but we have many blocks there, like uh, North China, South China, they were not part of Pangaea. So we don't, we don't have relative plate circuits. We don't really know how, how they... We know South China is going to collide with North China, and then you're going to close the Mongolosk Ocean in the, in the Cretaceous. We, we know what's kind of going to happen here, but we have no idea about the relative. So what do we do? Okay, luckily, 258 million years, we have a large igneous province, Emishan, in South China. It's about there. And from Palimag, we got to latitude, orientation, but of course, it could be anywhere on this white line in longitude, okay? It could be anywhere. So now we're getting a little extreme. So now I have my plume generation sound, a red line here. So I can fit, I can move now South China. I can't put it there because it would be top of Pangaea. I can't put it here, it would be top of Florida. I could put it around here instead of, instead of there, but this doesn't work because if you're going to go from 258 and you're going to collide with North China and close this ocean, you will get at velocities over a very long time for 20, 30 centimeter per year. So here we can use plate tectonic principle. So this, is, this turned out to be the only plausible. Um, so this, this is what we do. So I'm just going to show some snapshot here and call it absolute plate tectonics on a degree two planet. And what I mean, degree two, we have these two low velocity sound, basically upwelling, subduction are basically being, if you look at subduction for the last 20 million years, basically being in the same place. So that's the downwelling. It's a degree two planet. So we will, um, we will, we, we, we made this now, like in these movies now, these are the first time actually, where it, they're actually in the mantle reference frame, but you can see the paleomagnetic reference frame is a red here. It tells you true polar wonder. What's the difference? You, you can actually, we can make these movies now, and you, you can see this paleomagnetic pole doesn't, how it changes with respect to the rotation axis. So this is what we can do. So true polar wonder is very important, but I, I try to explain you, we're looking for this coherent thing when we're making this thing. So very briefly, this is what I think the planet look at 540 million years, the dawn of the Paleozoic. So here's kind of the principle. We, the good news at that time, we have Gondwana. You know, this is a hundred thousand, hundred million square meters, 64 percent of all the, all the, all the continental crust. We are lucky. So it isn't that hard. We have a big chunk here. We don't have to worry about. But what we have to worry about is Siberia, Baltica, Laurentia some China blocks and so forth. So what do we do here? It's a very interactive, um, we, we move the continents back and forth. Here you see Kimberlite on the margin there. Here you see it on this margin. 
Uh, but there are, in, there are in two different reference frames. The lower one is, is with correction, that's why I put a mantle, and this is without the correction. But you can see my plume generation sound have been rotated. I rotate them the same amount as true polar wonder. So I can show, show, I can show this correlation with or without. And of course, to do this, so we make sure now we build a world, we are building the perfect world. Be aware, I'm building a world which is better than since Pangea, because I say with Kimberlites, we can only fit 80%. I'm now fitting 97%. So I'm actually making a world which is too good. But that gives you some leeway, leeway to change it. And of course, we have to calculate the plate speeds all the time. We have to keep them realistic. And of course, the most important, the geology must fit. By doing this thing, ocean must open and collide at the right time. Otherwise, and this, uh, we did this in five million years for the Paleozoic, and this, this took about two years, just endless uh, repetition and, uh, to get it right. So this, I'll just go you a few snapshots. Uh, one of the oldest large igneous province we used to calibrate this is in uh, Western Australia, it's about 510. So here you, you see now for Gondwan, I have a large igneous province to calibrate it. Then I have a Kimberlite in South China and also South America. So at this particular time, I could correlate, I could get Gondwana in the right. But at this time, for instance, nothing from North America, not from Siberia. So, but at other times, we do have. <clears throat> Just show you how the rear opening, this is where Avalonia, England is rifting off. It's later going to collide with Baltica. This time, for instance, you see that only from North China, we have some very well-dated Kimberlite, so we only got a spot on that. Oops. Um, now we have uh, my favorite continent, Baltica, and uh, Avalonia, England collided in the late division. Here we have a fix now on Laurentia and Siberia, for instance, and we can go... <clears throat> and then Baltic Avalonia collide, we get a Caledonian orogeny in the Abadus sutures, but at this particular time only Siberia is constraining the model and so forth. We have a lip in Siberia here at about 400. Siberia is actually very well constrained through time. Here is actually an anomaly, that's the only anomaly I'm going to show you, because we, we were not able here in Russia at 400 million years to fit it because I would get extreme velocities. I actually have to start moving Laurentian. I we have to start to think we're going to build Pangea, and if I left it there, I would get totally unrealistic uh, velocities. So I had to, this is one of the few times we, we had to not use uh, these criteria. So here is Pangea and Sam Sambly. This is um, a 320. We only have a fix now from, from Russia here. And if you go to 300 million years, here we have the Skagra clip, we have uh, Kimberlites in Russia and also in Australia, so we get a kind of a fix of Pangea there. So this is how we're doing this thing. But it's an extremely uh, iterative process because I have to move the continents without true polar correction, and then I have to calculate them, and then I'm going to get a misfit again, and we did this six times with the whole planet for the whole of the Paleozoic before we got this model. But in the end of the day, this is what you get. So if I now plot all the Paleozoic, so that's from 250 to 540 million, I plot all the large igneous provinces, so of course Siberian traps comes in just in the end of it, or into the Mesozoic, but you see these uh, things. This one I didn't fit, it's actually a Panj Panjal, it's, uh, it's in the Neotatis, but these are actually a Loctinus, we don't, they might move a little, so I didn't force it for this particular one. Kimberlites, except these, these are these I pointed out, I have a problem, 400 million years in Russia, so these are anomalous. But a take home, our policy generate the logical plausible scenario, that's very important. With lips and Kimberlites, source from the margins, of course, I'm now testing whether these could be that long lived. And if they were not long lived, it was, let say there was a degree one planet, I think I would never be able to do this, because we are getting some sort of. So it looks like Mesozoic and Kenozoic time. So again, I'm pre preoccupied going back in time. So here, here is the first show, large igneous province reconstructed uh, back to 510 million years. So the red one, we use actually the hotspot, moving hotspot reference frame, or Dobrovini. And the, the, the one in green is Palimag, and you can't really see a difference. They, they both show this pattern along the margins. <coughs> But again, 12%, so, so, so it's not, not long going back, so that's the next step. We want to go beyond these 
And now I'm going to show you, because this diagram was showed yesterday, we might go back to 1.1 billion years. So Christian Tainer showed this one. Um, it's, very, it's not super, it's maybe okay. It's about six, 610 million years. We have, we have Palimag from Baltica. And, um, and the idea here, we do have magnetism in southern Norway. It might be related to the lip, but more importantly, we have this serve nap. Now It's actually now up in the Caledonian Mountains, we think of large igneous province, and it could have kind of erupted in this kind of position. We have also a lot of long range, about 615, and we have Kimberlites in Greenland, Kimberlites going in here. So what I've done here is I've actually rotated this line here. I'm assuming now that this lower mantle heterogeneous has been stable, and I make a world, can I, can I twist this whole thing until I get a fit? This is just a test case. But it's not easy to do it in Lapa Cambrian because the Palimag is very chaotic. It's called Ediacara in this last period. I call it Chaotica. Just from Baltica, we had six, seven poles of the same age, which are all different. So this is not going to be easy. So, um, so it, but it's possible. Maybe go back and why do I say 1.1 billion? That's what we think. There was the beginning of another supercontinent we call Rodinia. But it, it's still, we only have Palimag from a few of these blocks. We have some Kimberlites, we have a lot of large igneous provinces, and with some good ideas we can build something which make geological sense. But that would be the end. We can never go beyond 24%, I think. That would be pure philosophy. We are already in the early Paleozoic, coming to that. Just a few words, so uh, I'm doing reasonably good. Um, I've been very lucky to work with very good people. Rob Van der Voer, a great pattern, became my kind of mentor. And I met him because I'm a chain smoker. Because since we cannot smoke inside, I'm, I met all these people hanging around the door smoking. So I met him very early in my career. So he, he was my, originally my smoking friend, but he became a great mentor. Uh, Robin Cox, I work a lot. I mentioned earlier I used to work with Stuart McCarrow. Uh, and he was really a stratigrapher, but his very first student was this gentleman, Robin Cox. So he had a PhD with him in Oxford. He was the first student. And uh, shortly before Mac died, he approached me and said, why don't we start working now? So that had been a very fruitful for many, many years. And um, Vince Spockman, Louis Aspilow, Mike Gurness, who proposed me for the man, Dietmar Miller also with true G-plates, Taras, John, and also my favorite, it's so my colleague, Ray Trani, is my favorite cartoonist. He, he makes wonderful cartoons. They're not modeling, but they're cartoons. And he's very, gen very generous. He gave them to me. Whenever we write a paper together, he gave me his best cartoons. And also Stephanie Werner, my partner. So that's a special. But then there is two old men here, which are important. And they're both Arthur Holmes winners. So this is uh, John Dewey, 1993, and I remember because I was in Oxford and he was a great friend. I was very proud when he got to Arthur Holmes. I thought I would never get one myself. And of course, he was happy as well. And, um, and this is my old friend, also Kevin Burke, two only two years ago. And we have done a, only wrote one paper with uh, John, probably not the best paper I've written, but I did a lot with Kevin, 10, 15 papers. We, we, um, it's been great. We argue a lot because, you know, he's, he, he likes to argue. So um, I learned a lot about debating techniques, so I went to stop. And um, so this is from the field work actually in South Africa. Look at the redness for impact. You can see the pseudo tacolite and the melting of this three billion year granites when, when, the, um, when the impact came. Then I also want to thank a lot of um, I haven't had very many students because I worked in the geological survey in Toronto most of the time. We don't really have students. But some of them I did well. I'm very happy with uh, this one here. It's a professor in Oxford now, so, so that's pretty good. Um, but many of them, actually seven of these are professors now. Got a lot of grants, and at least one year grant is on Darwin now, he's in Utrecht. And um, so it has been very rewarding to work with, um, with young people. So this is my last one. I take EGU and colleagues and student at seed. I want to thank my bosses. She used to work for me, but now I work for her. So this is <laughs> Carmen Gainas. I hope she treat me. I only worked on her now for one and a half months, but it looks good. And this is my administrator, Trina Leeson. 
And um, this is our digital globe uh, at Seed where we work. And of course, one of the first things I wanted in was Tuso and Jason had to be there, you know. It's not just play tectonic. And the very final click, I want to advertise very happy Grace Shepard. It's in our group. She's the Honor Richer Award for Outstanding Young Scientist 2016. So I want you all to come in this room, if it's big enough, G1, Friday at 10.45. And she will talk, Sahara, this one doesn't really exist in the room, but she will talk about plates and, and mantle tomography and so forth. So, um, and then I have to thank EDU once again. And that's it. Thank you ever so much, Trond. Entertaining, a lot of food for thoughts, a uh, lot of good ideas, and uh, good luck with uh, the next 10 years when you'll uh, double the length that you can look back in time. We have uh, time for questions or comments. Oh, there is one in the oh, oh, yes, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, here, if you use the microphone over there. Okay. Uh, then, loud. No, um, in, in the early part of the and Ordovician, we have it more or less upside down with very good data, okay? When you come to this six, uh, when, when you actually do Palimag, which came later on these Ega Sundikes, which actually may be one of the best poles from the lab, it's, it's still, it, you couldn't really see that it's only rotated 45 degrees. If you go beyond that, yes, I made reconstruction for 750 and a billion. Uh, because Baltica was an equator, so you could actually turn it upside down and became a direct inversion. So I wrote papers on Baltica upside down, in the, but people weren't too happy about it, I think. They don't like it. They don't refer to it, so... Um, but in the Ordovician, all the camera is, is clearly very, uh, very rotated. So. Okay? Yeah, but it's clear that uh, they will be come to like it in the future sure. probably, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, please. Um, Tron, how confident are you when you go back in time that the age of the magnetization is the same as the age of the rock? Well, that's, uh, that's always a problem. And it's not necessarily a problem when you go back in time. That, that could be uh, equally bad in the, in the tertiary quotation. It depends. It's, it's the problem is that yeah. paleomagnetists don't yeah. look at the rocks. Yeah, I, I know, and, and there are many, you know, like, you live in Australia now, and the big problem there is lightning, you know, okay? Everything is lightning in use. We have to get rid of this thing. But uh, it's more a problem is, uh, as people have probably tried all the good rocks, and we are now exhausting uh, all kind of rocks which we normally wouldn't do it on. Uh, and that equally applies to young as old. You know, you can have remain station and, you know, and you thing going on all the time. Um, so... Uh, I'm not super worried about that. Yes. You have Use the microphone. Please. Yeah. You have South Africa fixed back to around 120 or so, um, but it's over a geoid high. Would you expect it to uh, slip off the geoid high at some stage? Uh, well, the whole of um, it is it is slightly slipping off, you know, but it's. Remember, in Pangaea, uh, the whole of Pangaea is sitting over uh, uh, the geoid high, okay? Which is because you have dynamic topography and you have a geoid high there. And Pangaea breakup is essentially going away from that high geoid, okay? And that's also reflected in, in long wave uh, sea level. You see during Pangaea, you had a minimum because everyone is sitting on this high, okay? And it's, it's slowly, but Africa is slowly also moving away. But it's been, you know, Africa's broken away for, you know, a long, long time. So it's still remained pretty fixed it, over that high, is, which is unusual. Yeah, it is unusual. But it's partly because of the geometry. If you think about, you, you have a spreading ridge, just, 
it's almost surrounded except into the Mediterranean area. So there, there is some sort of maybe regulating control. But, but it is one of the most stable. Actually, Europe is actually more stable if you look at it. But uh, we use Africa because it's more, it's better when you go back in time to assume this stability. Okay. Okay. One more. Okay, I think it's uh, time to stop. Uh, let me just uh, repeat uh, Trump's advertisement for the uh, 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 an Arista Outstanding uh, Award uh, Lecture on Friday. And let me also remind you that you're all invited to come and celebrate this year's, all this year's awardees tomorrow afternoon at five o'clock at, uh, uh, at the award ceremony with the uh, uh, reception afterwards. And then I think we should uh, all thank uh, Trond again for a great lecture. <laughs>